Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Amanda Ellison. I am the executive director of the Wolfson Research Institute for Health and Wellbeing. It gives me great pleasure on behalf of my co-directors and institute manager here at the Wolfson Research Institute for Health and Wellbeing to welcome you all to this, our latest public lecture in, in our public lecture series here at the Institute. And indeed, it's on a topic that affects us all. Professor Fuchsia Sirwa, from the psychology department here in Durham is a globally renowned expert on self-regulation and well-being. And she heads up the self-regulation and health and well-being laboratory at Durham University. She's particularly interested in the way people direct and manage their thoughts, their emotions, their behaviors to reach their goals. And this includes lots of risk factors like loneliness, perfectionism, and our topic for today, procrastination. Understanding how they link to our health and well-being and their causes gives us traction to address the issues at hand and look at our health from another angle. And if there's nothing that speaks to the ethos of the Wolfson Research Institute for Health and Wellbeing, it's that. Fuchsia has recently published a new book called Procrastination, What It Is why it's a problem and what you can do about it, in which she puts across her game-changing insights into procrastination and what to do about it. So I won't procrastinate any further, see what I did there, and I'd like to hand us over to Fuchsia and very much looking forward to your talk, Fuchsia. Thank you for coming. Great, thanks very much for that kind introduction, Amanda, and thank you all for, for coming today. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about um, an issue that some of you may have some experience with or know others who have uh, dealt with this, this common issue, which is procrastination. And specifically, I'll be focusing on um, the implications of procrastination for health and well-being. Um, as uh, Amanda noted, I look at the risk and resilience factors. Um, I am originally from Canada, as you can tell by my very non-British accent. Um, I came to the UK in 2015. I've just recently joined Durham in May 2022. Um, and procrastination is a, a particular um, sort of long-standing research interest of mine. I've been, when I looked at the timing, I've been, I've been researching it for, it's been actually over 20 years, surprisingly. So I can say that I am an expert on procrastination Research. I like to add that research on the end there, <laughs> just to make sure that people don't get the wrong impression there. Um, so we we put together um, an edited volume, one of the first edited volume on procrastination, health, and well-being back in 2016. And since then, I've been working more, as Amanda mentioned, on um, writing more lay-oriented. Um, but evidence-based uh, books, including an audio book for Audible and, and the book that she mentioned, which is published by the American Psychological Association and just came out a couple of months ago. So a lot of the insights we'll be presenting today, how I draw upon um, that previous work, both the lay work and, and also um, the, the academic volume there. Okay, so just to give you an outline of what we'll be looking at, we'll define what procrastination is, what its implications are for health and well-being. Then we're going to take a, a look at psychological science, why people procrastinate, and then some evidence and some approaches for understanding how we can actually reduce procrastination. So you know, procrastination is one of those topics that we get a lot of sort of clever quips and jokes about. And this one you've probably seen before. You know, people talk about, you know, you procrastinate, you put things off to tomorrow, and tomorrow becomes this mystical land where 99% of all human productivity, motivation, achievement are stored. And you know, this is a common sort of way of thinking about procrastination, that it's something that's, you know, very light and you know, when you put something off, boy, procrastinate it. But I think it's before we get into some more of the more technical issues of procrastination. I think it's really important to put out there what procrastination is and what it isn't. Um, and it is a form of delay, so we are putting things off to tomorrow, um, but it's a particular form of delay. And it often gets confused with other things and, and sort of the, the, you know, the reasons why people procrastinate um, are often um, not necessarily guided by um, scientific evidence. So we, you often hear that procrastination is just someone who's not managing their time well, right? So it's poor time management. Um, but actually, the evidence on procrastination, poor time management is correlational at best. Um, and there isn't a lot of theory behind that either, because if you, you know, just because you don't manage your time well, um, doesn't mean that that is the same as procrastination. It's more, we could look at it as a symptom of procrastination rather than actually a cause or being equivalent to procrastination. 
But I'll get into more of that a little bit later. Um, we often think too that when people are procrastinating, that they're just simply being lazy, <laughs> not doing anything at all. Um, um, but procrastination isn't laziness for a number of good reasons. Um, one of them being quite simply that when we're feeling lazy, we have no energy um, and we don't feel like doing anything at all. But often when people are procrastinating, they're doing anything but nothing. In fact, they can get quite very busy with uh, engaging with non-essential tasks, um, everything from um, completely reorganizing and cleaning the kitchen or their office, to curating their digital music library, to even alphabetizing the spice rack. I mean, the, the lengths that people will go to to look like they're busy while they're procrastinating um, are actually quite amazing. And some of the anecdotal stories I've heard from people are, are quite humorous. Uh, but again, that's, again, not laziness per se. Um, so the word procrastination comes from quite literally the, the, the Latin root procrastinus, which is mean of tomorrow. And this is what happens when we put things off. We, we're, we're saying, I'll get to it later or I'll get to it tomorrow. Um, and so technically we define it as a particular type of delay that is by definition harmful. So it's unnecessary, it's voluntary. So you, you didn't make the cho choice to delay something because it was wise, because you need more information. Um, it wasn't an emergency that pulled you away from that task. You voluntarily said, I'm going to put this aside. Um, and it can happen at the start or during engagement with the task. And this type of delay occurs um, despite recognizing that there's going to be negative consequences for yourself or others. More recently, we focused in on sort of slightly adding on to this definition by saying that it's a, a type of, of self-regulation failure. Um, that involves prioritizing short-term mood repair over long-term pursuit of, of your intended actions and goals. <laughs> Just a bit of background, um, it does affect some, anywhere 15 to 20 percent, actually re more recent estimates suggest maybe even 25 percent of adults and um, 80 to 95 percent of college and university students will procrastinate um, occasionally, 50% will do so on a more regular basis. And it can occur not just in academics though, or in the work environment, people put off dealing with their mental health issues and their physical health issues as well. And we can think of procrastination too, as we often just think of it as a single behavior, but actually that for some individuals, that single, simple, that single behavior then becomes repetitive because when you procrastinate, um, as I'll discuss a little bit later, you, in, you're actually reinforcing that procrastination behavior, making it more likely that you're gonna use this as a way to deal with tasks that you find unpleasant. So much of the research that I'll be showing um, and talking about today, um, when we actually measure procrastination in the lab, it's quite a tricky thing. It's, it's very hard given the definition to set up a circumstance where somebody has a task that they intended to do rather than tasks that the experimenter said, here, I'd like you to do this, um, and then give them a choice to do something else, which is not quite the same because the, if the intentions are weak towards the task, then technically it's sort of verging on not being procrastination. So what we do instead is we tend to use these sort of self-report measures to um, understand people's tendencies to procrastinate. Um, and so it's almost measured more like a chronic procrastination or a personality trait. And then by examining people who are prone to using procrastination to deal with tasks that they, they don't want to do, um, it gives some, we can get some insight into um, some of the underlying processes involved, the precursors, as well as the consequences of that procrastination. In terms of the implications for health and well-being, um, you know, this is an area that slowly started. Some of the early, earliest research was done back in 97, and I myself started going, getting into it back in the early 2000s, um, sort of on the back of that very first study that found that student procrastinators were more prone to having health problems and higher stress. Um, since that time, there's been a, a number of different studies that have looked at, for example, the, the mental health implications of, of procrastination, and they've consistently found that people, especially those who frequently procrastinate, experience higher levels of anxiety and depression. Um, a lot of my research has focused more on the physical health aspects, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today is the physical health implications of procrastination. And, and across you know, numerous studies, both myself and others have, have found that you know, procrastinators, they put, if you put off things in general, you're going to put off seeking medical care. 
um, you're going to have higher stress um, and higher stress combined with things such as poor health behaviors and poor coping um, tend to be sort of a, a, a nice recipe for, for poor physical health overall. Okay, so you start off with poor initial procrastination behavior and if that becomes more of a chronic habit, um, then again, the implications for health and well-being um, can span a whole range of different physical health issues. And I've just sort of a quick summary here. I am gonna go into some of these uh, particular um, studies in a little bit more detail, but you can see you know, the full range here from stress to acute health problems, to maladaptive coping, to delays in medical care seeking, delays in, in engaging with health promoting behavior, less social support, um, and, and even less poor coping with um, chronic health conditions. All of these have been linked to, um, or been associated with people who chronically procrastinate for, for a variety of different reasons. And the reasons why we might, you know, we might not think that procrastination can be bad for health. We think, okay, it's about productivity, right? It's, it's you're not gonna get your work done. So you're gonna suffer in terms of performance at work or, or in academic spheres. Um, but if we think of procrastination as more of a, a chronic tendency, almost like a behavior pattern or personality trait, then we can bring in to bear these you know, uh, classic models of how personality might link to uh, physical health. And what those models consistently show is that if you have um, a general tendency or, or personality trait that creates more stress or is linked to higher stress and is linked also to poor practice of health behaviors, then these become the two pathways um, to, towards which you might expect would explain why they would um, experience uh, poor physical health outcomes. So this sort of modeling of just the stress and the health behaviors is what guided much of my research over the past 20 years um, to try to understand why procrastination um, might have implications for physical health um, and some of the processes that might be involved and also how we might be able to address those. Um, now specifically with the stress here, um, we, I refer to this and, and, and not sure that I would still call it direct, but in my early um, modeling of, of procrastination and health, I refer to this as a direct route because we think about procrastination increasing stress and that impacting the immune system. And this is both creation of unnecessary stress by putting off deadlines, which then come back to sort of haunt you and create even more stress. Um, and then you've got the indirect route. And I say it's indirect here because it, you know, if you don't engage in um, healthy behaviors, it's not gonna make you sick the next day necessarily. Well, unless you're really overindulging on something. Um, it tend to be more of a cumulative route or an indirect route um, towards poor physical health outcomes. And so if you don't engage in health, health protective behaviors or um, you engage in unhealthy behaviors, then that again becomes sort of a, a recipe for um, poor health outcomes. So the very first model they tested back in, in 03 was this idea based on um, this idea of two different health behaviors, delaying treatment, as well as not engaging in health promoting behaviors or what are called wellness behaviors as well as stress. And so the original model was this, okay? So maybe procrastination leads to higher um, you know, acute illness complaints because of these two particular routes. And this was conducted with um, a group of first year undergraduate students this is, uh, back in Canada that conducted this study. And interestingly, um, when we tested these pathways, it was using sort of mediation analysis here, um, that the health promoting behaviors didn't actually um, explain um, or contribute to, shall we say, um, the relationship between procrastination um, and the higher complaints of, of acute um, health problems by the students. It seemed to be more along the lines of stress and actually putting off going to seek treatment for health problems they had, which then made those health problems worse. Well, that, okay, so yeah, I mean, these are young adults. Um, you know, it's going to take a lot of years before a routine of poor health habits is going to catch up with them and really have an implicate, you know, an impact on their health. So let's see what happens if we, you know, then look at this model in a community adult sample. Um, and the other thing too is we can think about students as being a lot under a lot of stress. Right, um, and so maybe this link between procrastination and health, which had only been shown once before, only applies. Um, to students. Maybe it doesn't apply to, you know, everybody else, and it's just because they're under so much stress. Um, 
so now when I ran reran the model with 254 community dwelling adults, interestingly, the health behaviors pathway was significant. And it was um, showing the procrastination. You can see there um, that path is, you know, negatively correlated and quite a moderate to high level with um, a practice of, of uh, health and wellness behaviors. And then that explained um, the greater amount of illness. Now, I looked at that pathway separately because stress is such a huge, um, you know, contributor to, to poor health. I wanted to just see how, how they played out um, separately. But when the two models were nested, um, stress kind of overtook and was the winner, if you like, um, in explaining why um, people who chronically procrastinated had um, greater complaints of, of, you know, headaches, colds, flus, and just poor overall general health. They saw themselves as not having very good health as well. Okay, tells the health behaviors in there. Again, you can see the negative, negative association um, between stress and health behaviors. And this is classically what we see when we're more stressed, we tend to not engage in, in better health behaviors. And when we don't engage in health protective behaviors, it makes us more vulnerable to stress. So you've got that, that sort of bi-directional path there. Um, but it, is, it did seem to be that stress was um, the more potent um, explanatory pathway there. Okay, so that's cross-sectional data. Um, and so the next step then, and this was, I happened to, to um, conduct, collect further data with that um, initial student sample across three points across the, the academic um, year and had them basically uh, complete measures of stress, health behaviors, and self-reports of a number of different acute health problems they were experiencing. And this is done across those three time points. As you can see, the idea was then to sort of try and model to see, okay, is there a potential causal pathway here? So again, with correlations, obviously we can't say but what's what's happening um, ahead of what. So and the idea here was to test the directions here. Is it just stress at time one that's predicting stress at time three, et cetera? Um, or is it procrastination that's, that's going through one of these particular pathways? And in this analysis, what we found, again, very similar to the cross-sectional study with the adults, was that it was stress um, appeared to be, again, um, a key pathway for explaining the, the health issues associated with chronic procrastination at time one. Um, so that was where the significant path, it procrastination, ten, you know, people who are more prone to procrastination at time one experience greater stress at time two, and that explained their um, greater report of acute health problems at the end of the academic year. Okay, so you know, just sort of taking from that research then sort of looked at this model um, more generally again and saying, okay, procrastination does appear to go through stress. Health and behaviors are in there, but it's a weaker pathway as you can see by the dotted line there. Um, and, and again, this makes sense. We're just sort of, if we take procrastination out of the equation there, we know, for example, um, that there's a number of different reasons why stress can relate to physical health problems. So greater activation of the, the hypothalamic pituitary axis, sympathetic nervous system arousal, dysregulation of inflammatory responses and immunocompromise. Um, whereas you know, poor health behaviors are a gateway condition to obesity and cardiovascular health and a number of other um, chronic health problems. Okay, because that was more or less well-established then, so the next thing then became to try and understand, okay, so why is it procrastinators experience higher stress? And why don't they engage in health promoting behaviors? I mean, it's easy to say, well, they put off everything, so they put off the health promoting behaviors, but what specifically is going on there? Why are they having difficulty engaging with um, these health behaviors that would improve their health? <clears throat> um, and some of the things that we've, we've found, and I'll go through um, some of these very quickly, is that coping, um, so using poor coping strategies and not getting enough sleep um, are, are two potential pathways um, for explaining the higher stress linked to procrastination. Because we know when people don't get sleep, they are more vulnerable to stress. Um, and also in, with respect to health promoting behaviors, one of the things we investigated is whether they were vul more vulnerable to social temptations to not eat healthy. Um, so being around others who were sort of saying, hey, you don't need to eat healthy, come on and indulge. Was that something that might be contributing to their difficulties and sort of um, engaging with um, these health protecting behaviors such as getting regular exercise and, and making healthy food choices. 
Um, so with respect to the coping, can, we conducted a um, small scale meta analysis using both unpublished data sets and very limited published data at that time, looking at different coping styles. Um, and the question here was, is it just that they're not using adaptive coping strategies um, or is it because they're, you know, you're using more maladaptive coping strategy, which, which has a stronger tie here. So which is sort of their, their coping strategy or of, of choice here. Um, and although both pathways were um, significant, you can see here that the maladaptive coping have the stronger associations with a, um, an average correlation of about 0.31, and that's across 15 independent samples with over 4,000 people. Um, so it does appear that the use of maladaptive coping strategies, including um, disengagement, avoiding coping, using drugs and alcohol to cope, those types of things seem to be um, one of the reasons that they might be experiencing more stress because all those strategies of course don't manage the stress they just put it off quite literally and um so it comes back um to deal with for something something to deal with in the future um, we've also did a study looking at um, sleep quality um, to examine that idea that poor sleep quality uh, might be linked um, and interestingly the pathway that we tested here was that we looked and this is kind of a circular path, so uh, because these are cross-sectional studies, um, we know the relationship between stress and poor sleep quality is bi-directional again, so they tend to feed off each other. So when you have higher levels of stress, you get poor sleep quality. When you have poor sleep quality, you tend to be more vulnerable um, than stress, and procrastination was linked um, to both of these um, across uh, two samples in this one study we conducted. And this was conducted with both um, a North American sample and a, a Greek student sample. Okay, so we also wanted to look more specifically at um, how why procrastination um, or people prone to cro uh, chronic procrastination might have more difficulty um, engaging in health promoting behavior. So we conducted this uh, prospective study, it's again conducted back in Canada, um, and specifically recruited individuals who said, I'm making a healthy change. I'm going to improve my diet, I'm going to exercise more. Um, and we had we screened them to make sure that they in fact had these goals I'm quite clear. Um, we got 211 at time one, not surprisingly, but we dropped out half dropped out probably because they didn't follow through with their goals. <laughs> uh, and indeed, when we did an analysis of uh, you know time one um, scores on procrastination versus time two completers, uh, the time two completers scored significantly lower on chronic procrastination. So um, these estimates I'll show you are probably quite conservative. Um, and we found significant associations with um, being, one of the things we want to look at if they were socially tempted, to the extent to which they found that social temptations made it difficult for them to follow through with their intended health behavior changes. Um, indeed, um, it was chronic procrastination was associated with that. Um, it was also associated with less enjoyment. We asked them, how much did you enjoy? Um, trying to make this healthy change? How frustrated were you in trying to make this healthy change? And this was again over um, a six month period too. So fair enough time for them to make those changes. Um, interestingly though, we also tracked how successful they were. Only 53% of the whole sample, this is everyone, whether they're procrastinator or not, were successful in making more uh, one or more healthy changes. And um, not surprisingly, chronic procrastinators tended to um, not be less successful in making um, their, their health uh, behavior changes. Now, when we look specifically at the role of social temptations here, um, what we found was that people who were prone to procrastination or these chronic procrastinators uh, expressed having less enjoyment um, for making that, that health behavior change that they said that they would make, and that social temptations actually moderated that. So that the more that they felt tempted by others to not follow through with their health behavior change, um, the less enjoyment they found. So these temptations were coming in and actually influencing sort of the, the, the effective side or the effective perspective that, that um, individuals had about the health behavior changes. Um, and one of the things that we know about procrastination is it is tied to um, mood repair issues. And, and like I said, I'll get into that um, shortly. 
We also looked at frustration and there was a data link there too. So they felt more frustrated um, if they were socially tempted. And that was also um, more likely to mean that they procrastinate on making their, their health behavior change. But the pathway through um, feeling less good about their um, health behavior change was actually stronger than the one for just feeling bad or frustrated about it, which is interesting. So, so it's sort of showing that a lack of enjoyment um, seemed to be a driver here for not being able to follow through with those um, intended health, healthy changes. Okay, so that's sort of a, a quick overview of a lot of sort of more of the acute things. I want to just quickly also just highlight, I think, you know, we're, we're talking about acute health problems and not engaging in health behaviors, but we know that if we allow stress to continue, we don't manage it effectively using that because we're not using adaptive coping strategies or we don't engage in healthy behaviors, that these over time, these can have cumulative costs. So if you have people who are prone to procrastination and who are, you know, constantly setting themselves up for higher levels of stress and not engaging in health behaviors, we might expect that over time there might be some cumulative costs. And so working from that initial model, the procrastination health model, um, I've showed you before, we then sort of decided to take an extended look at this. And so what happens then if we're considering chronic stress by not just you know, frequent procrastination, but now this is like sort of a habitual way of dealing with things. Um, and not just health behaviors, but trying to maintain your health or engaging, for example, if you now have a chronic health condition, disease management behaviors, um, how might that affect your health status, especially if you already have a, um, a, a chronic health problem or you might be vulnerable to having health um, issues. And again, the same sorts of pathways here, but we can also think that it might be more sleep disruption, uh, poor symptom management, it might be exacerbation of existing um, symptoms such as pain, um, depending on the overall health status of, of, of that individual. And so this, this is um, just data we've only presented at a conference and sort of looking to write up here. And this is where we looked at um, to that self-report measure of chronic procrastination amongst a sample of people with fibromyalgia, which is a chronic pain syndrome. And we asked them some questions about their coping efficacy, how well they felt they were coping with the emotional aspects of their fibromyalgia, the daily problems of their fibromyalgia, and their symptoms of fibromyalgia, as well as their, their basic satisfaction with relationships and, and their life and themselves. And for each of these, those who were scored higher on chronic procrastination tend to say that they were coping less effectively and they were less satisfied with their life. So clearly it was having an impact um, on their well-being here. Um, and again, fibromyalgia on itself is difficult to, to, to manage, but if you throw in now a tendency to chronically procrastinate, just su suggesting that it's creating extra vulnerability uh, for overall well-being and coping. Um, this study is another study conducted um, with about almost 1,000 community adults, um, and from that sample, we took out uh, about 180 with self-reported hypertension or cardiovascular disease. And then from the remaining group, screened out a sample of just over 500 people who had no report of any type of chronic health condition, um, sort of these healthy controls, if you like. And the idea here was to see, okay, so if over time, it might make you more, you know, not having higher stress and not engaging in health protective behaviors might create vulnerability for poor health, then we might expect that um, individuals who chronically procrastinate might have a greater risk for um, developing poor um, chronic health conditions. And so in, in particular, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease to the pathways to their development involve chronic stress and, and poor health behaviors. So I compared first the um, mean scores on um, that measure trait procrastination. And not surprisingly, those in the hypertension and cardiovascular groups um, scored significantly higher on chronic procrastination than the healthy controls. But okay, there's lots of things that can explain poor heart health, um, sociodemographic factors, uh, even other personality factors such as the big five, which are well known to, to be predictors of poor heart health. And so, <clears throat> when you threw those into the model, I thought, okay, that's gonna wipe out procrastination. In fact, procrastination wiped out the big five factors that are 
numerous studies have shown predict poor um, heart health over time. Um, and it, above and beyond fatigue and socioeconomic factors, um, got really kind of a bit of a concerning but surprising um, odds ratio which suggested that for every um, one point mean level increase in chronic procrastination on that scale, the risk for having cardiovascular disease or hypertension rose by 63%. Um, so that's not, you know, that's not trivial. That's something a bit concerning. And again, this is cross-sectional data, but it is suggesting that, again, from that sort of theory of understanding how stress and health behaviors might create uh, extra vulnerability for chronic health conditions, such as uh, poor heart health, that procrastination, again, may be adding into the mix of adding more risk and vulnerability. Um, and, you know, some of these effects, so too, just sort of, I, I'll just put this slide up because we think if we're thinking about personality and personality health, sometimes the effects can be quite small, um, depending on the outcome that you're looking at. Um, but I always like to quote Ozer and Bennett Martinez here from back in 83, they were, you know, wisely suggested that um, although some of these effects are small, if we aggregate them at the population level, um, they are, actually can be considered quite large in practical terms, so we get routinely consequential. So they're not something that we necessarily want to overlook. Okay, so procrastination is so harmful. Why do people procrastinate? All right. Why do they do it? And one of the things that we, we proposed and I sort of hinted at before was that it's procrastination is not about this poor time management, it's actually about poor mood management. There's a, a, an emotional component to uh, procrastination um, that's at the core uh, underlying people's tendency to procrastinate. And, you know, we put this theoretical paper out um, almost 10 years ago or so that's just starting, finally starting to get some, some traction. And this idea that uh, based on the research that, that we reviewed at that time, which shows quite clearly that people don't procrastinate on fun and exciting tasks, they, find, they procrastinate on tasks that they find unpleasant um, or boring or lacking meaning or structure, um, that it's, it has to do with the mood. When you're putting off the task, you're actually avoiding the mood as a means of short-term mood repair. So it's a way of externally regulating emotions through avoiding coping. Um, and this is sort of the position that I've taken in a lot of the research that I've, I've um, conducted since that point in trying to understand um, and also address procrastination is it's not about, you know, giving people more um, time management skills. These are all sort of band-aid solutions. At the core of it, we start procrastinating when we have an unpleasant task and we can't regulate the emotions around that task. So we use procrastination, put that task aside, get immediate relief, which unfortunately is also very reinforcing to continue to procrastinate because it's a very fast and easy uh, way to sort of shift that mood and make that hedonic shift from, from feeling more negative to feeling more positive about something. Yeah. Um, the, the issue with procrastination, though, though too, is that the sort of avoided coping, it provides only temporary relief. So effective emotion regulation strategies tend to have lasting effects, whereas procrastination as an emotion regulation strategy actually does not. And as I mentioned, this tends to have a reinforcing um, effect, which um, can be quite um, concerning for some individuals. And the other thing we throw into mix here, so you're putting off those negative feelings or emotions around a task that's unpleasant. Um, and it may be because you're not sure about the task, you've got some doubts, anxiety, some stress, some frustration, maybe it's just boring, whatever the reason, this sort of aversiveness can run a full range uh, across the spectrum. But when we procrastinate then, we get immediate relief from those negative emotions. So it is short-term mood repair, but that is soon replaced then by feelings of guilt and shame and stress because that deadline's still there or that task we said we have to do is still there. And we also know that when we're procrastinating, we're transgressing social norms, right? So we have a lot of social norms about being productive members, contributing to society. We don't, you know, when we procrastinate, we know we're letting ourselves and others down and this can lead to feelings of guilt and shame. And again, the research um, supports that. And this can kind of cycle then. So now you put off a little bit of negative emotions only to have it grow and amplify into something even bigger, which that can then per can perpetuate and feed into a cycle of procrastination. Um, and so it's not just the feelings of guilt and shame, but you can add another layer onto this. And, and some of the research suggests too that people 
um, who are prone to procrastination also tend to be highly self-critical of themselves. So they tend to evaluate themselves in a very negative manner um, in relation to the task. So it's not just the task that might trouble them a little bit, it's actually how they see themselves in relation to that task. Well, this, if I'm doing this task, I don't do a good enough job, it'll make me look incompetent, um, others won't you know, look up to me, um, others won't uh, want, you know, associate with me. You know, just, so it's a transactional type of negative emotion that happens. It's not just coming from the task being unpleasant. Often the task isn't unpleasant, but it's how the individual sees themselves in relation to that task and the transaction of those negative emotions that can really spiral out and make people feel um, like they just want to go anywhere except um, having to do that task. And so the types of negative um, self-evaluations, this is um, research done by, by, by Gord Blett and colleagues where they discovered that um, these types of negative thoughts are very common amongst people prone to procrastinate. Um, you know, they say, I'm letting myself down. Why can't I finish what it starts? So, and they sort of a type of rumination, sort of an automatic thought, ruminative negative thoughts. And again, these negative self-evaluations only serve to generate negative emotions. And in one prospective study, they actually showed that those who engage in these types of procrastinatory cognitions, these negative ruminative thoughts about procrastinating, tended to experience higher levels of negative affect and procrastinated more two weeks down the road. Um, so they actually do feed into that, that cycle of negative emotions that can be um, very detrimental, not just to well-being, but to also to keeping the cycle of procrastination going. <laughs> now, I'm not a neuroscientist. I've just put this up very briefly because, um, you know, all this is kind of in support of this idea of how critical emotions are um, when we're trying to understand procrastination. And uh, this is just one of many studies that's been done now where they actually look uh, doing sort of um, fMRI scans of the brains of, of and, and sort of the brain morphology of people who chronically procrastinate versus those who don't. So they look at those with high scores versus low scores on, on a on measure of chronic procrastination. Um, and some of the things they're finding mapped onto what we suggested, which is that there's difficulties in emotion regulation. Um, and so in this particular study, they found procrastination scores were associated with, um, you know, gray matter volume in the orbital frontal cortex, which is linked into um, the limbic system and also um, other centers related to uh, emotion regulation, suggesting again that there's difficulty there, um, that there's, they're having problems in being able to um, regulate their emotions or doing so in a way that's negative rather than adaptive. And I think this, this piece I really like because it, it sort of speaks to this idea of emotion regulation being really critical. Um, it's a fantastic um, study. It was a multi-study here, but I've shown, so one part of it that done by Eckerd and colleagues where they actually um, had people who were identified as being risk for procrastinating a particular task. And they ran them through a emotion regulation training, a web-based intervention um, that had to do with, uh, had multiple different um, aspects to it. But the one that they found that was most effective was the one that focused on tolerance of negative emotions. And so this involves such as taking deep breath, identifying those feelings, um, learning to reappraise them and tolerate them. And those who were able to sort of modify through reappraisal and tolerate those aversive emotions attached to the task um, procrastinated significantly less than those in the in the, the waitlist control group, suggesting again that emotion regulation and especially training might be effective approaches for addressing procrastination. Okay, okay so down to the key question then, how can we reduce procrastination? And so obviously if you wanna address an issue, you've gotta know what its causes are. And so from, from our perspective, it's about emotion regulation. Um, and helping people manage the negative emotions that they have around tasks that they're avoiding. And some of the research um, that um, has been conducted by one of my former PhD students suggests that actually meaning and meaning making might be um, valuable strategies for helping people uh, manage their emotions. Um, so CC Yang, she's just graduated um, last spring. 
Um, she conducted this wonderful study um, where we had three different um, groups. It's an experimental study. And she had in one group, which is control group, they just wrote about their task that they had to do. And these were all people who had a, a, a challenging goal that they, they were you know, at risk for procrastinating. In the positive emotions group, they just wrote something positive about the goal that they were working on. And the meaning making group, she had them complete these sort of stems that were saying, this task is meaningful because, and they had to finish that end. So there were several of these, this, this task is valuable to you know, others because this task is important to me because, and these were um, statements taken from, from uh, another validate measure of meaning making. Um, and what she found was that, so in the meaning making group, um, it was only goal rated meeting that increased. It didn't increase positive feelings. This was important to sort of a control here in the positive emotions group. It was only positive emotions that increased significantly. Um, and she followed up with them 36 to 48 hours later and had them actually sort of map um, how much procrastination they had engaged in in minutes. So you sort of using a time block method. And what she found was that those who were in the meaning making group procrastinated for significantly less time than both the positive emotions group and the control group, suggesting that if we can get people to see their tasks through the lens of meaning and to see why it's important to them, um, it, it can dial up some positive feelings for sure about the tasks that they're um, procrastinating, but it can also maybe give context. It doesn't make always make all the negative feelings go away, but it gives context to those negative feelings. It makes it to say, yeah, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable, but it's okay because it's important for this reason. Um, and so that I think is a really strong value of um, that research. And she also looked to just to double check here. So in the meaning making group, the reason here um, that they spent less time procrastinating was because it did reduce their negative emotions. Okay, so again, it seems to be another um, potential way of helping people reduce their procrastination. Um, other areas have been interested in has been self-compassion, which is this idea of showing compassion to oneself the way that you would to other people. Um, and use, so Kristin Neff has defined it as taking this kind and understanding stance towards yourself in instances of pain or failure. So when you're struggling with the task or even after you've procrastinated, um, because as we know, procrastinators can be quite critical and hard on themselves, whereas self-compassion is something that gets people to be um, more tolerant of their own flaws and inadequacies and being self-kind, seeing that their failings are part of the human condition, that no one's perfect, and being more mindful of um, their emotions, trying to keep these um, in balance. Now, if someone's low in self-compassion, though, <laughs> um, you can imagine that they're going to be more self-critical and disapproving and judgmental about their flaws and inadequacies. They're gonna feel isolated, like they're the only one doing this. Everybody else is getting on just fine and reaching their goals. And they're the only one really struggling with procrastination, for example. And they may get over-identified and ruminate, right, um, about um, their procrastination, much like that research on the procrastinatory co cognition shows. Um, so one of the first studies I did looking at this possibility about um, people procrastinating and their levels of self-compassion involved these four different studies, um, three of them being uh, student samples, one being a community dwelling adult sample. Just basically here looked at um, across two different time points, um, whether procrastination, how it was related to self-compassion and stress, perceived health, a number of things. But the key factor here is how it relates to self-compassion. And across all of um, the samples and time points, procrastination related to lower levels of self-compassion. Um, and because we know self-compassion can be beneficial for reducing shame, you know, reducing stress, improving well-being, um, it also may be something that can help people manage the negative emotions and self-critical feelings they have about themselves when they, when they procrastinate. So it might be a, a viable um, option there. And I think for me, one of the important parts of self-compassion, especially because of the shame that people experience when they procrastinate, which keeps them from reaching out to get help, is this idea, and we use this in our experimental studies when we try and do a self-compassion induction, remind them, you know, you're not the first person to procrastinate, nor will you be the last. Um, and it's not about giving a free pass here for the behavior. It's about trying to take the edge off some of those negative emotions that may be making it difficult for people to step back and, and say, yeah, I'm not happy that I procrastinate on this. But, you know, beating myself up about this isn't going to 
get me any further towards my goal or make me you know, better able to not let myself and others down. So much of the research on self-compassion has found that it is very good for motivating people to be tolerant of their own um, mistakes and flaws and, be, and, and motivate them to um, want to engage in self-improving action. Okay, so I'm just going to finish up here um, with a couple of other things. I said there's a number of other strategies, but I think these strategies that focus on emotions are, are really important. Um, one of the things I'm really interested right now with my research, and I think it's really important if you know we can say yes, emotion regulation is important for procrastination, and we need to help people regulate their emotions to reduce procrastination. But we also need to understand when people might be more vulnerable. So I've been talking about procrastination as sort of a, you know a, a, a behavioral tendency. But that doesn't mean, you know, that at certain times we might be really good at managing our behavior and other times we are not because there's things going on in our lives. And this is what I've seen about the context dependency of procrastination. So the idea that might here is that vulnerability for procrastination might increase in situations where people's background levels of stress and difficulty are high. Um, and the reason is they've reached their coping capacity, right? And this can happen because of life events, but it might also happen because someone's trying, struggling with a chronic health condition or a disability um, or some other chronic life stressor. So it's not a character flaw here, or it's not sort of pigeonholing them as, oh, you're a chronic procrastinator. There's circumstances in their life that's actually now making it easier for them to deal with those emotions around a task that they don't want to do by procrastinating and putting it off. So avoidance becomes a quick and easy solution because they just don't have anything left to try and manage those emotions. So I think it's really important to, to look at that and understand that. And that's some of the research I'm, I'm planning in the next while is to try and understand that. And that if we can identify those individuals, then the, the solution there is to have provision of additional coping or emotion regulation resources to help um, them reduce their potential procrastination. The other thing too, is that we, we tend to often, procrastination might happen to when we expect that something's going to be really horrific and time consuming and frustrating and, you know, some, a task we've not done before, or we have very little guidance on and we get very worked up about what we might expect it to be. And then often when we get started with it, we realize it is actually not that big of a deal at all. It actually wasn't that time consuming or frustrating or difficult. Um, and this happens because um, we tend, as human beings, we tend to be very faulty in our uh, forecasts or effective forecasts. In other words, we you know, numerous studies have shown that we tend to be very poor at predicting just how bad we're going to feel in a challenging situation. We overestimate um, the negative feelings that we're going to have. And this can happen, I think, too, in, in, and be a precursor to procrastination. And the, the solution here is to make sure that people have the information that they need. So in organizational settings, some, you're giving somebody a new task, for example, make sure it's absolutely crystal clear to them what, they, what steps are needed to complete that task, what information is needed, and make sure the lines of communication are open so that they feel free to ask questions should they reach that uncertainty. Because this type of anxiety and uncertainty-driven um, procrastination is easy easily avoided just by giving people um, the resources and the information um, ahead. So this is, again, I've started to conduct research um, in this area, but I think this is an important area too as a, a sort of easy way to heading off procrastination before it ever gets out of hand. Okay, so just to finish up, so procrastination is a uh, harmful form of delay. It involves a prioritizing short-term mood repair over reaching goals. It can take a toll on health and well-being um, via poor health behaviors and increased stress. Um, the source here we suggest is a difficulty in regulating negative task related emotions um, is at the core or the root of procrastination. Um, and meaning making self-compassion show promise, but I think we still need to know a lot more about some of the, the circumstances that might make people more vulnerable um, to procrastinate. Um, if you want to know more, and these slides will be available afterwards, there's several links here. Um, you can test yourself on your procrastination levels, um, and there's some animations that have been created based on my research about what procrastination does to your body, and, and also um, what happens when people procrastinate. Okay, thanks very much for your attention, and um, yeah, I think we hopefully still have time for some questions. <laughs> thanks so much, Fuchsia. Gosh, that was so interesting. I think we all saw some of ourselves, or perhaps a lot of ourselves, in what it is that you're talking <laughs> about there.